Hello everyone. Today we'll be learning about a new way of looking at physics, a new sort of quantum model that can be used to describe atoms and other very small particles. We can see here a picture of uh, a reaction between a number of very, very small particles. These little white paths in the photograph are in fact the trails left behind by these tiny particles as they move through uh, condensation. So, to start with, let's talk about some of the shortcomings of Bohr's model, which was the last model before quantum physics started coming into play. One of the flaws of Bohr's atomic model is that it couldn't explain where the electrons were in an atom. He knew that if there was one electron, it had to always be in the middle one, but what if there was more than one electron? I mean, wouldn't they all just drop to the lowest energy level, like this? But that wasn't observed to happen, because if it did, then the spectral lines of the different elements would have been very different. So Wolfgang Pauli uh, proposed a new quantum rule to describe how they behaved. He didn't describe why they behaved like this, but his rule managed to show exactly where the electrons were in an atom. So Pauli's exclusion principle means that no two electrons in an atom can have exactly the same properties. That means if you have two electrons in an atom, they either have different energy levels, or they have different spins, or they have different quantum numbers, or that sort of thing. There are a number of quantum numbers, but we don't really need to learn about them just now. So one of the properties of an electron is its energy level, or orbital, which we've learned about. And another one is its spin, which isn't really an actual physical spin, but it has to do with angular momentum. It can only take two different values for an electron. It can be uh, we call it spin up or spin down. For electrons, there's nothing in between those. For some other particles, there is. So only two electrons, one with spin up and one with spin down, can occupy the bottom energy level. We can see that at level one. After that, it's full. There aren't any other spins that an electron can have, and so it can't go to energy level one. Other electrons get pushed up to the next energy level. So one of these electrons has uh, energy level 1 spin up, when it's energy level 1 spin down, and here we have energy level 2 spin up or spin down, doesn't really matter. And in fact, uh, once we get to level 2 and higher, there are some other quantum properties. And because there are these other properties, we can actually fit more than 2 in level 2. Pauli's exclusion principle is an empirical rule. It was used to describe reality and not to explain it. Uh, Pauli didn't know why this rule worked, he just knew that it did. It would be a little while before someone could come up with an explanation for it. So a more complete theory of quantum mechanics was developed in the 1920s by two different people. The theory was developed independently, so on their own without uh, looking at too much of the other person's work, by Erwin Schrödinger on the left, and Werner Heisenberg on the right. So the two used very, very different mathematical approaches uh, in order to create their models. And so in the end, both of their models looked quite different, but both models produced exactly the same results. If you've ever done much maths, you'll know that usually there is more than one way to arrive at an answer, and as long as you uh, don't do anything wrong, you'll always arrive at the same result as if you use a different method. So, uh, we'll look at Erwin Schrödinger's uh, model first. Uh, his model uses equations, wave equations, uh, to describe uh, particles' properties. We can see here, if you've done any wave mathematics, which doesn't seem too likely, that this is in the form of a wave equation. We have a derivative here of position and a derivative of time. So this equation is called Schrodinger's wave equation. If we were working with uh, y as the variable, then it would be here and here and here. So that means that we're actually taking the derivative of this with respect to two different things, one with time and one with position. You'll notice that there's also an i in the equation, 
And that has to do with complex numbers, which aren't really covered as part of this slideshow. So the particle's position in Schrodinger's wave equation, instead of being very clearly defined, like the particle is here, is actually spread out. So it means that instead of saying the particle is here, we say the particle is around here somewhere. So it you know, could be there, but it could be there as well. There's a little bit of a chance that it could be, be, could be over there and so on. So it means that the particle's position is not clearly defined. All right, so that's uh, Schrodinger's model. Uh, it turns out the amplitude of the wave shows the probability of finding the electron there. So the, the higher up the wave is, the larger the chance that the electron is there. This model was able to explain a number of things. It was able to explain atomic spectra, which we can see over here, hyperfine spectral lines, because the different electrons in the different energy levels had a slightly different energy due to the wave equation. And it was able to uh, explain the chemical bonding energy, the energy that it takes for one atom to bond with another. That, of course, had to do with the, uh, how the waves of the different electrons or the Schrodinger wave equations of the different electrons interacted with each other. So, on to Werner Heisenberg. Heisenberg used matrices, singular matrix, to describe particles instead of waves. So all of his equations looked very, very different. Instead of having a wave equation, he had a whole set of matrices. The predictions of his model were completely identical to Schrodinger's model. In fact, the two models were equivalent. They just looked very, very different. An interesting result of these models is the uncertainty principle. Uh, today we know it as Heisenberg's uncertainty principle because he was the first one to uh, explain it and sort of describe it. So Heisenberg's uncertainty principle states that there is always uncertainty in a particle's properties. It is impossible to know everything about a an electron all at once because it's not ever everything all at once. Do you see what I mean? Well, it's impossible to know a particle's exact location and its exact momentum at the same moment. In Schrodinger's wave equation, we can see that the values for these vary with time. So here the uh, yellow line is the position of the electron and the blue line is its momentum or maybe the other way around. Anyway, you can see that it's changing, but we don't know where exactly the electron is. The result can also be derived from Schrodinger's wave equation, because of course the, the two theories are equivalent. So when a particle has an exact location, and we know where it is, it doesn't have a clearly defined speed. If we look at uh, Schrodinger's wave equation, uh, we'll know that the particle starts out in the middle, so the equation will look something like this. But after that, it'll sort of spread out. So the particle could have gone that way, or it could have gone that way, and there is no way of telling which without measuring it again. But that would bring up its own problems. Because when we measure it, we can either find the position, which will mean that we can't figure out how fast it's going. Or we can figure out how fast it's going, but not its position. When a particle has an exact momentum, it does not have an exact location because it's sort of behaving like a wave. So if we have a particle that's moving along at constant speed or through a box or something, it'll behave like a wave like this, and it could be here, or it could be here, or it could be here, and they all have about equal probabilities. We know it's probably not there, and it's probably not there, but exactly where it is isn't actually a physical location as long as it has a clearly defined momentum. Which is weird, but as far as physics can tell right now, that's exactly what happens. So because of this, it's impossible to measure both properties at the same time. 
either measure the um, position and make its momentum random, or we measure its momentum and make its position random. There seems to be this sort of fundamental core randomness at the heart of the universe. Why this is, we don't know, but as far as we can tell, it's there. So that's the end of the theory. We've gone through some of the interesting uh, ideas and consequences of quantum mechanics. So let's go on to some questions. Don't worry, they won't be too hard. Question nine. Which of the following states that uh, no two electrons in the atom can have the same properties? So I have a few things here. Schrodinger's wave equation, uh, equation the Pauli exclusion principle, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, or the de Broglie hypothesis. So all of these are equations or principles or hypotheses, and they all say something about the nature of matter, but only one of them will answer the question. So let's go through them. Schrodinger's wave equation is a way of describing a particle's properties. The current interpretation of quantum mechanics says that it describes all of a particle's properties. And when you can't measure the momentum after you've measured the position, that's because it doesn't really have uh, a momentum property after you've measured the position. Uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle states that you can't know the position and the momentum at the same time, uh, but it doesn't explain why, uh, it doesn't say that uh, two electrons in the same atom can't have the same properties. The de Broglie hypothesis states that electrons behave like waves, and it's part of the explanation for this effect, but it's not the theory that states it. In fact, that would be the Pauli exclusion principle, and that's what states that identical electrons are excluded from being in the same atom. So B is the correct answer. Question 10. Which the following consequences of quantum mechanics is incorrect? We have a few options here. Photons can only have certain energy levels. No two electrons in an atom have the same properties. Particles cannot have an exact position and an exact momentum at the same time. Or particles can diffract like waves. Let's start at the bottom and move upwards. D, particles can diffract like waves. Now electrons and photons are both examples of particles, photons that eject electrons in a photoelectric effect, and electrons, which have been proved to be particles. But both of these can diffract, so they're both waves as well. So particles can diffract like waves is a correct consequence of quantum mechanics, and so it's not the answer that we're looking for. C. Particles cannot have an exact position and an exact momentum at the same time, and this seems silly, especially with our Newtonian classical mechanics. But the thing is, both Schrodinger and Heisenberg agreed that it's impossible to know both of these things at once. And as I said before, the current interpretation of quantum physics says that they don't have both at the same time, and that's why we can't measure them. All right, uh, no two electrons in an atom have the same properties. Well, this is just Pauli's exclusion principle. Uh, and it's a big step forward in quantum mechanics in explaining how the electrons in an atom behave. And so our last option is photons can only have certain energy levels. And hang on. Oh, that's right. Electrons can only have certain energy levels. Photons are under no such restriction. Photons are the energy levels. So discrete energy levels are an electron thing and not a photon thing. So A is not a consequence of quantum mechanics. Question 11. What is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? I'll give you a moment to think about it, maybe rewind the video. Uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle states that it is impossible to measure a particle at the exact position and its exact momentum, uh, momentum at the same time. Particles with a well-known position don't have a clearly defined momentum. Particles with a clearly defined momentum don't have a position. So it's one of the strangest things about quantum mechanics, but as far as we can tell, it works. Question 12. If all particles with momentum have an associated de Broglie wavelength and Schrodinger's equation, then why don't we observe uh, wave behavior anywhere else? Why do we only see it on such a small scale? I mean, we've got a de Broglie wavelength, that's one wave. We've got the Schrodinger equation, which is strongly related to the de Broglie wavelength, and that's another wave. So why can't we see this in everyday life? 
The answer is because the wavelengths associated with a particle are much larger than an atom is tiny. For the, the de Broglie wavelength is far smaller. The Schrodinger equation has a far, far smaller wavelength. And so it means that no wave detector is really, behave, uh, is really detectable at all. For all intents and purposes, they're not waves. The associated wavelength of light objects is billions of times smaller than even the nucleus of an atom, which means that they're not going to be diffracted by atomic matter if they can be diffracted by anything at all, which doesn't seem to be the case. On to the last question. Question 13. How did Heisenberg's approach to quantum mechanics differ from Schrodinger's approach? Remember, both of these scientists made their theories of quantum mechanics at about the same time. So Heisenberg used matrices to describe electrons and other particles, but Schrodinger used wave equations instead. And of course, these look quite different. Wave equations, you have stuff like uh, dy over dt squared equals k dy over dx squared, something like that. But a matrix is something like an array of different values, you know, something like this. And as you can see, it looks very, very different to a wave equation. And so this is the main way that Schrodinger and Heisenberg's uh, models differed. The thing is, they were more similar than they at first seem. Both models, although they use very, very different mathematics to describe the subatomic particles, produce exactly the same predictions and results about what these particles would do. And so they are, in fact, uh, equivalent theories. So that's the end of the questions and the end of the lesson. So in this lesson, we've learned about uh, quantum theory and quantum mechanics, how it applies to particles like electrons, and in fact, even heavier particles, and some of the big advances uh, that were made by various scientists as the theory progressed.